We live in a world where it's offensive to preach the gospel of Jesus and to talk about his name. And I'm here to talk about it. Welcome to the Jesus is Offensive podcast. What is good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Jesus is Offensive. I'm your host, Taylor Werfelman. Thank you for tuning in on this Friday. Hope you guys are all having an amazing day and looking forward to the weekend. I know I for sure am. Um, Things have been crazy, crazy good, so busy, so much fruit, and just uh, I hope you guys are um, just experiencing fruit as well, that that God is moving in your lives and and that these podcasts are making a difference. I had a lot of you guys reach out about Nico's podcast last week, and I'm so glad that you guys enjoyed that one. It was a joy talking to him. Uh, that was actually my first time meeting him, which was crazy, um, which is actually kind of cool. I, I like that it was very organic and just like I didn't really know what he was talking about um, before I heard it. So that was like really fun and Man, he was a blessing and he really inspired me. So thank you, Nico, for coming on and I'm um, glad you guys enjoyed it. I, I pray that you were just pumped up by him and that you were inspired to go out and do the same thing, to live more radically for Jesus. Um, I thank you guys also for you who have bought a t-shirt. Uh, I so appreciate that. I saw we had some more sales the other day and and uh, I just, I'm really thankful for that and um yeah, I hope that you guys use the t-shirts for the glory of God, that um, they help to share the gospel with someone. And um, yeah, well, today we are going to get into a little teaching. Uh, no guests today. Uh, I was kind of throwing back and forth what we should talk about today, but I think um, this one just kept coming to my mind, and and which is uh, dating and, and relationships um, as a Christian, right? This is a very tough topic to talk on. Uh, especially because um, I think there's a lot of room to call people out on and that can be hard for people and I understand that. So I'm going to try to be as chill and nice as possible. Um, But I'm more here to kind of just lend advice that I have because I have also been, uh, you know, I've studied this and uh, I know the struggles of being in a relationship Um as a Christian and just kind of what comes along with that. So I wanted to lend advice and I wanted to look at a biblical perspective of dating and, and these kind of things, because I think in the church it gets very muddled up um, and it's not clear. And it's also not convicting enough to keep people from sin. And unfortunately they're opening themselves up and really ruining their relationship because of the kind of things that they're indulging in together as a couple. So, you know, I've learned the hard way, but I've got, some great teaching over the years now and just biblical perspective. And I've just come to realize what a biblical relationship looks like. And it's not easy. I'm going to tell you that. Um, but I'm so glad that you're here. Um, even if you're in the older crowd or, or, you know, married or whatever, I pray that you would stick around. I think this is good for your kids or, or just for anyone that needs a biblical perspective, you might be able to lend a hand. I know a lot of kids just need, truth spoken into them because I know that relationships are a very tempting thing uh, when you're in them. Obviously, you always say when you're out of them, oh, you know, I can handle myself. But when you get into them, you always, well, I don't want to, I don't want to curse anyone by saying this, but you normally mess up, right? Because you're not prepared. So I think even if you're older and more wise, this will be a good teaching for you to help others um, when young people come to you or or whatnot. So I think this all around is a great teaching for everyone, but especially to the young people, definitely speaking to you today and and to myself. Um, This was when I first heard this teaching, it was very hard for me to take, but I knew that it was the truth and it changed how I date and everything. I mean, I haven't really dated anyone since I like changed my perspective. Um, But I think that's actually a good thing. And I'll also explain that as well. So Let's just dive into some prayer and then we're going to get into this tough topic. Be prepared, get your Bible out, and let's just really search the scripture together. So, dear Lord God, I I just thank you for this opportunity to talk about something that I'm very passionate about and that I feel like um, the church has missed the mark on, Lord. And I feel bad for all those kids just like me out there that just didn't realize what they were getting themselves into when they made mistakes and, or, you know, whatever it is, big or small. um, We all feel, well, in that moment, we felt shame about it. And um, 
obviously we thank you that you've taken that away from so many of us, Lord, and that's a whole another discussion. But I just pray that you would help me to give teaching that is helpful uh, and is applicable to people and that people would really take it in and really take a dive to change, even though it is hard and it is a bummer to be that Christian who, you know, has to say no to this and no to that, but it that it's so rewarding. And uh, yeah, God, we just thank you. We thank you for this podcast, Lord, and, and just be in it all over it today, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit just flow through these airwaves to whoever is listening, God. Uh, bless these people in your mighty name we pray. Amen. So yeah, let's let's open up. Again, we're going to be cruising through the word today. Um, well, actually, I want to open up by saying when you read the Bible, you don't really find anything about dating, to be quite honest with you. And I love that because that's a part of the argument that um, back then, obviously, yes, I know many of you are going to say, well, that was culture. You know, there was no dating. Yes, but also... Um, I think there's a problem with how the world sees dating. I'm not against dating, right? It's like courting. Um, but I think how we use dating, how we see dating, what we let fly in dating, like, I mean, the extreme is, you know, moving in together, but even just anything involving lust is sin. And I think dating is a very dangerous thing. So let's just open up to First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. And uh, that's where we're going to start today. So that says, let's see. All right, here we go. Um, I'm pulling this a little bit out, but um, basically, you know, he's writing to the Thessalonians. Um, but from reading this, this applies to us. This is all throughout the Bible. And I felt like this was just the most concise and best way to explain things. So it says, uh, verse three, it is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Wow, so that's really strong there. So I wanted to use that um, as my base to go off of because why, um, among other things, right, it says avoid sexual immorality, right? And that's not a suggestion, that's a command. And he also says uh, control your body in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like what the heathens do. So if you call yourself a Christian, you have to rid yourself of lust. That's that's number one, Okay. And uh, the basis or grounds from where this uh, whole uh, teaching is going to kind of be based on is the idea of lust, right? What is lust? Um, so again, like I said, a while ago, I, I watched this video and it changed the way I saw things. Obviously, we all know as Christians, hey, don't don't have sex before marriage, right? But I think, and I can speak to this going to a Christian school, we all use, I haven't had sex before marriage to justify every other thing uh, that we do. But you have to look at, it um, less like um, vertically and more like linear, lin, linearly, <laughs> if those are horizontally, I guess you can say, because vertically is saying, okay, I either had sex or I didn't have sex. But horizontally is more looking at sex as a slippery slope um, to sexual intercourse, right? But because, um, you know, the main idea of sexual intercourse is, you know, a man, you know, and a woman becoming one, right? But there are so many different levels to it. It's not just, and I'm sorry to use some words, but for lack of a better term, you know, it's not just penetration that that is sex, right? We we know that there uh, are a lot of different ways of doing things that we shouldn't do. Obviously, God designed it uh, to be that way. Um, but I think we like to justify that just because we haven't had, you know, uh, what God deems as sex, which is like, you know, like I just explained, your classic uh, idea of sex that doesn't mean that you're still not lusting right now of course sex before marriage is very important to a lot of people i understand that but i've talked to people that you know sex before marriage is important to them but they've also messed around and, and fooled around and done a lot of other things so my question i want to pose is what really is the difference right there is sin remember how um paul even said you know okay if you're a murderer and a liar it doesn't matter you've you've broken the law you're guilty of sin uh, et cetera et cetera so we can't look at Christianity as a whole as, you know, I set these rules for myself and because I didn't do those, I'm a good person, right? That 
And, you know, I was talking to Albert who was on the podcast the other day and he was just explaining to me uh, about my story of how, and it kind of dawned on me that, you know, I was always called myself a, you know, quote unquote Christian, but um, I made my own law and then I justified myself to my own law. So it was like, hey, don't have sex before marriage. Don't drink before you're 21. Don't get drunk, da, da, da. Um, Boom, right? But that's self-righteousness when we look at it. So many of you are self-righteous saying, well, I haven't had sex before marriage. I'm good. I'm good, Taylor. I don't need this message on, you know, how to make my life harder. Okay, I'm not having sex before marriage. But we have to look at it as he's saying, abstain from lust and sexual immorality, right? Anything that is sexual in origin, right? Or that causes you to lust. So this kind of just, became this whole new idea for me when I kind of, this dawned on me, the idea of one, there's no dating in the Bible, there's marriage. Um, So dating shouldn't look anything like marriage in a sexual way, obviously in a relational way. Sure. And we're going to talk about that, but in the perks or, you know, for lack of a better term that you get when you're married, that is not, that does not carry over into um, a dating relationship. It just doesn't. And uh, again, you can call me hardcore or crazy, but You have to think about, and this is the rule I started making for myself, what causes me to lust? It's not about this law that don't have sex before marriage. What if making out causes me to lust, causes me to have lustful thoughts towards this girl that I'm making out with? Or what if, um, you know, something further, like, you know, again, I don't want to get into risky terms here, but we have to talk about the real stuff, right? This is Jesus offensive. This ain't, this ain't lollipop church. So you got to think about, uh, I, I, I'm a young kid. I, I know what people do, right? It's not just kissing, right? It's it's touching, it's feeling, it's whatever it is. But all of those things, yeah, they might not be sex in your mind, but are they causing you to lust? Because if they're causing you to lust, you're breaking God's law. And honestly, you're kind of cursing your relationship because you're starting off on a wrong note. There's not supposed to be any type of sexual relation between any of you. So even if it's laying down, making out, I'm sorry, to me, that's that's a slippery slope to sex. What is what is really the difference? You're lusting, you're you're um you're following the ways of the flesh, right? You're indulging in something that makes your flesh feel good. Um, but it has nothing to do with God. It has in fact you don't have those rights according to the Bible because why they're causing you to lust. And and all of you know if you have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't, maybe you don't. No. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you know, because I've been in those situations where I went too far, I did something wrong. And I realized that's, that's wrong. I can't do that. But to me, my, my, you know, self-righteous law was like, well, Taylor, you didn't have sex. So what's the big deal? But my mind was like, no, that was wrong. Like I, my mind went too far. Like even if my body didn't catch up to it, my mind went too far. And imagine if my body did catch up to it. So that's why this is a serious matter. We can't just think, okay, I'm a Christian. So that means I can kiss, I can make out, you know, we can lay down together or whatever. As long as we don't have sex, we're good. It's like, no, that there's way more to this. And it's not about being Mr. Law abiding. It's about making yourself holy for God. Are you in love with God? If you're in love with God, then your relationship should show that. And I'm going to look at your relationship and say, hmm, do you love God? Because I don't see that in the way that you're acting around this person, in the way that you're indulging with this person. This is, you have to ask yourself this, is your relationship, is your attraction a fleshly uh, attraction or fleshly relationship or is it a relationship led by the spirit? Obviously, you have to wake up to this person every day if you decide to get married. I'm not saying that it's a sin to be attracted to this person. I'm just saying that overall, number one needs to be the spirit attraction. And especially when you're dating, like it needs to be centered on God because the physical stuff and all that stuff, yes, that comes with the marriage, but not with the dating. We've got it all twisted up and wrong. And that's why so many marriages are failing too, because, you know, I've heard this by so many people. I'm not necessarily Christians, but, you know, people are literally getting in relationships and having sex to see, you know, oh, it, you know, is their sex going to work for me? Is their, um, you know, way of kissing going to work for me? Whatever. That's so dumb because you're not connecting on the heart, the flesh, it's never enough. It's always going to want something more. Um, so if you're connecting sheerly based on your sexual attraction or, or, you know, um, your, you know, uh, chemistry or whatever, you know, sexually, it's not going to work. It has to be based on the heart and knowing each other and, and connecting in the same spirit. And that's why, again, you have so many marriages that are failing because it's all based off the physical and not, who these people actually are. So you're yoking two people that don't really know each other and don't really love each other. So that's the number one thing. What causes you to lust? And 
Again, I'm going to end the video with this at the end, but for now, just keep in mind, what causes me to lust? What am I indulging in that causes me to lust? That's the thing that I need to cut out of my relationship with my person. But bottom line, I don't care if you've been dating for four years. This is something now that you have to decide, okay, I got to put that in check because this is causing me to lust. And I know men out there, this is, is this hard because men, yes, you were created to be attracted to women. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. God created us that way. Okay. There would be no way we would be able to procreate if you were not attracted to women. And I'm not saying women that you aren't attracted to men, but men, even if you look at the statistics and all that stuff, they have a much higher sex drive and, and lust and all this stuff. So I understand, but that's again, why also the man, you're, you're, um, you're the head of the house when you get married. Okay. You have to, even before you're married in relationship, you need to keep both of each other in check. Um, because you're, you're the dude. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be sexist here, but unfortunately men in many ways can get women to do many things, um, if they want it to happen. Right. But men, that's why it's falling on you. You need to step up to the plate and be like, listen, we can't do this anymore. This is causing me to lust. And if it's causing me to lust, I'm sinning against God. I don't care if it's the relationship is working out. Your relationship with God is not working out. Right. Let's go over to, uh, first Corinthians six, 15 through 20. 20. I don't think anyone's going to be offended by that, but again, I'm not trying to be sexist here. Okay. I'm just, just trying to explain that either side, whatever you're on, you need to step up to the plate and say, look at our relationship. We are lusting and it is not holy to God and we need to fix things. I don't care if you've been dating for four years. I mean, if you're dating for that long, maybe you should figure out what you y'all are trying to do. But anyways, <laughs> let's go to first Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, which is do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Wow. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I have been set free. I have no shame, but there are still nights when I'm, you know, laying in bed, you're just, your mind is just going and you think of something you did and you're like, God, I'm so sorry. I don't feel shame about it, but when you think about your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you all of you who have listened have done something wrong sexually, have have uh, indulged in something that they shouldn't, have gratified the flesh a little too much. Do you realize that you're sinning against the Holy Spirit, a te the temple of your body? Like he said, sexual immorality, all other sins a man commits are outside his body. This one is sinning against your own body. And again, above, the reason I read the whole prostitute thing is because you have to see sex in a different way, okay? I understand that with the law of Moses, right? They would write, um, uh, you know, papers for divorce and for marriage and these things. But in the beginning, what signified marriage? It was sex. It was, and they knew each other, right? You read about Adam and Eve. There was nothing like, you know, and God came down and, and did a, um, did a, uh, marriage, um, ceremony and, you know, married the two. No, they, they knew each other because they had sex and that was what consecrated the, the marriage, right? Again, I'm not here to argue about that. You can have your own opinions. I think in America, yes, we need to go and obey the law and get legally married. But I'm just saying, when you have sex with someone, you realize you're uniting yourself to another person. Like this person, just said, like he just said, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute or anyone else is one with her in body? So this guy thinks, oh, I'm just going to have sex with a prostitute. She's just a prostitute, right? Like it means nothing. I just need to satisfy the flesh. And Paul's saying, no, do you realize you're uniting yourself with her? That's a soul tie. That's spiritual, right? So obviously we, we know this is the groundwork. This is why we aren't to have sex before marriage, not just because it's a good idea, but because it unites yourself to someone else. And obviously, yes, for those of you who have had sex before marriage, repent, okay? And, and if you haven't been baptized and set free and all that stuff, you need to do that because um, you need to become born again because unfortunately you have bound yourself now to someone else. You have soul ties. Okay. And that's again, a whole nother conversation. Reach out to me if you need prayer for that. Um, my point here is it's, it's, it's not a shameful thing. It's just that God warned us. Why? Because he doesn't want us to unite with someone that is not our soulmate. That, that's just setting us up for disaster. 
and sexual immorality, it's sinning against ourselves. I know you guys, I, I dealt with, you know, pornography, masturbation. Obviously it wasn't with someone else, but it was against my own body, my own flesh. These are things that will destroy you. And that's why lust, the lust is the inception to all of this, right? If you're doing something that causes you to lust, you know, I was in a relationship three years ago and I told the person, listen, uh, this is weird and awkward, but I, I don't even want to kiss you because I want to make sure that, you know, I'm not lusting. And, and this was when I was trying to figure things out. Obviously, I think, and I'm just saying this as my perspective, you need to ask God and come to it yourself. I personally think for me, a kiss is not something sexual, uh, like a peck that is something respectful. Um, I, I, again, I don't want to talk too much about kissing, but um, for me personally, kissing has never a lot of my family members still kiss on the lips. You can call that weird. I, I don't really care. My point is I've never seen a kiss as being this sexual, romantic, weird thing. Now, making out is totally different, right? Because it's something you keep indulging in. But a, a, a short peck, for me, that's not lust. So to me, I've made the boundary of, okay, God, that's not lust. So that's okay. But I'm not going to make out with someone until I get married to be quite honest with you, because I know where that leads me to. I know where the, those thoughts lead me to. I know how my body reacts to uh, making out with someone. And I'm sorry, but that's just, that's just the honest truth. And I think you guys all need to evaluate. Um, and I doubt you thought I was going to say that because that's pretty radical. Um, but even I was very nervous when I decided, you know, I got out of a bad relationship and I realized that I was sinning against this person and against myself and that I was very scared to do that again. So even with the next relationship I had, I was like, listen, I don't know if I even want to hold hands. Um, and to be honest, it was a short relationship and actually nothing happened physical at all um, because I just really want to put myself in check. I'm not saying I would do that again. I'm sure uh, when I find my soulmate, um, we will hold hands before we get married. My point is, is um, you need to be so on guard. Can't go into relationships this thing. Oh, this will all be great. You know, we're just not going to have sex. You need to talk about these things. You need to have your own boundaries that you abide by that are biblical, not just self-righteous boundaries, boundaries that are in place by God, right? And we know, look at Genesis 2.24. Let's turn over there real quick. Actually, you don't even need to turn over there. Well, I would love for you to see it, but you all know the verse if I can get there. My goodness. Uh, Genesis 2.24, which says... For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh, right? Um, that, of course, God set us up to be married. There's nothing wrong with uh, the idea of being physically attracted to someone, right? Um, it's the problem when you do it outside of the marriage bed, when you do it um, prematurely, okay? Um, we are not to experience these things until we are married, um, and yes, it's great. But again, we have to keep our perspective on God. We can't just be like, okay, well, we're going to rush into marriage. So we can have sex. Because again, you're making something physical be an idol in your life. And yes, I know sex is totally ordained by God and it's an amazing gift that he's given to us. But are we making it all about that? Are we making it all about gratifying the physical? Where is God in the relationship? Where's God in the relationship? We really need to look at that. And that's what leads me to my next topic here. What What is the center? What is the center of relationship? Okay. So again, what, we're talking about what does dating look like as a Christian? Well, it's not about the physical. It's not about, hey, let's go watch a movie and let's cuddle and make out and all this stuff, right? That's what the world pushes. No, dating should just be like a normal relationship. And what do you do in a normal relationship? You get to know each other. What does the word dating imply? A date, right? You, you, meet someone and you talk and you learn things about them and you share um, your heart with each other and see if they they match on the same level. And that's why what's beautiful is as a Christian, and not just a Christian, you don't want to just bound yourself to a Christian because a lot of people call themselves a Christian. I'm talking about as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. Dating is important, yes, because you need to meet with people and you need to see where they are with God. Is God their number one? Are they willing to make God the center of the relationship if you guys, you know, date or get married or whatever? God has to be number one. So if you meet with someone for the first date, a good sign should be all you pretty much talked about is God. I know you sound like, oh, that's crazy, Taylor. You, I have so many other things. But guys, I'm being serious with you and I'm not here to glorify myself. But when I meet with someone, there's not much else to talk about besides God because it's what I'm le living, breathing actively pursuing. Yeah, there's other things I love in my life, of course, but 
nothing matters compared to God. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what I want to share with someone that I'm looking to love potentially in the future. So that has to be number one. What is the purpose of dating? Is it to make yourself happy? I got to tell you a little story for, so for myself, you know, I think about a year ago, I was really at the point of God, you know, I've lost so many friends. I've, I've changed my whole life for you. I've turned away from sin. God, please just send me, you know, my wife so that, you know, basically so that I can be happy. You know, everything will be fixed if I have my wife basically was my thinking. And God really corrected me and made me see that I was making an idol out of this idea of my wife. And it's so easy to do. Um, but I realized I started changing my prayers and it's worked so well and God's taken that away. I don't even think about it anymore. Obviously, I pray for my wife and, and who she might be and, and that God will bless her and bring her at the right time. But it's not about God, please bring her. You know, I'm, I, I need her because I started reminding myself I am nothing less right now than I will ever be because why I have God. I am full. I'm complete. I don't need a woman. I don't need um, a friend. I, I need God. That's number one. Uh, that's all. So I started recentering my prayers around God. When you think I need a partner in crime, when I need a partner in ministry, you send her, right? Of course, we're going to share other things. Of course, we're going to do fun little dates that have no connection with discipleship and stuff. Yes, that's not a bad thing, you guys. It's This isn't this isn't the law. Remember, we have freedom. But the idea is if you are in so in love with God, who should be your number one spouse, right? Like first you're married to God, then you find, you know, a, a humanly person to marry because a human marriage is not eternal. It says there will be no marriage in heaven. So first you're married to God because that's the eternal marriage. And then you're looking at, okay, God, I'm doing ministry for you. And if you want to send someone that we can connect so much on a level that is unexplainable, that would help me to make disciples better than you send her. That's what has to be the goal. And if your goal is to gratify your flesh, you really need to put yourself in check and be like, why do I want a girlfriend? Why do I want a husband? Is it for my glory, for my desires, or is it for God's desires and for God's glory? Of course, guys, I want to be married. I'm not trying to play hardball here. Of course, many days I think, wow, I just can't wait to have a wife and be in love and all that stuff. But I always have to recenter and think, am I in love with Jesus? Am I first being in love with Jesus? Because if I'm fully in love with Jesus, I recognize that I don't need anyone to love me. I don't need anyone to love. I just need Jesus. Yeah, that's radical to some of you guys, but that is the point of the gospel. We are to marry Christ. Marriage on earth is just a picture of our relationship with God. So why should it be any different? So again, you really need to put this in perspective for yourself. Why am I doing this? Is this to glorify God's kingdom or is this to glorify me? I can't, I know I've repeated that a million times, but you need to bat that into your head. Is this for me or for God? And that's why I started praying like, God, send me the person that is to help the ministry and to make more disciples than I can make alone. And remember, love doesn't have to be sexual or romantic. Of course, when I get married, it says in the Bible, don't abstain from sex unless, you know, you're fasting for a time and it's mutually beneficial to each other. But do not withhold sex from either of each other. Of course, the, all of the physical stuff comes along with it. But my point is, is number one, the goal will be to make disciples. The goal will be to make disciples and to change the world for Jesus. It's like having a partner. It's like having a best friend. And so often we look at, relationships as what can you give me, right? When I was praying for God, I was asking God, you know, send her because I get this from her and I want this from her. That is so horrible. I'm, I'm looking for her to gratify me. You know, my parents, they have a beautiful relationship and they always tell me, look, if God is at the center and you're both looking to please each other because remember God said, you know, or John said, love one another, right? Just as Christ loved you. So for one, I'm loving God. And because of that, I'm loving one another. So if I'm always focused on what can I do for my girlfriend, my wife, and she's always focused on what can I do for Taylor, we're always going to get what we need and it's not going to be um, about ourselves. We have to die to ourselves, you guys. So again, I think a lot of you who are listening have relationships or have ideas about relationships that are rooted in your flesh and you need to repent for that and you need to come to God and just ask him to show you his love to experience a marriage between him, to have him be your husband, him be your wife. Sounds crazy, but he's done it for me. And I, I know how it feels. Of course, there's nights where I'm like, man, God, I can't wait for that that wife. But then I always just recenter. No, God, you, you are enough. You are enough. I know you're going to bless me with a wife, but you are enough. I don't need anything. Once we start saying the whole, I need this, I need that, we're in a bad way because God knows what we need 
and he provides what we need. So if he hasn't provided a wife, then I don't need her yet. That just, that just popped in my head. That was, uh, that, that, that resonated with myself. Like, wow, that's really good. So thank you, Lord, for just speaking. So yeah, I want you guys to really think about this and really pray into this. Why am I in this relationship? Why am I seeking a relationship? Why am I seeking attention from men? Why am I seeking attention from women? Is it for God or for me? When I meet my wife, we're going to talk about God and we're going to be like, okay, the number one goal is to make disciples. And, and you know what's funny? The more I've indulged myself in God, the more I changed my tune. Before it was, you know, the romantic, you watch a movie, oh my gosh, I can't wait to kiss this person, hold this person's hand and do this romantic date. But then you start realizing, wow, I can't wait to just have a friend I can just share everything with, just like how I share things with God, but someone in the physical that we can do life together for God's glory, not for ourselves. So we can travel the world for God's glory, that we can be sent out wherever God wants to send us for God's glory. It has to be for God's glory. It can't be about yourself. Marriage is here to benefit God's kingdom. Everything is here to benefit God's kingdom. He's the king. And man, are we lucky that we even get to experience love with someone, that in the midst of sharing the gospel, in the midst of having a partner that we work together, we get to just share each other and love each other. But the thing is, when you guys are dating, it needs to be focused on friendship. Imagine dating a guy as just a friendship. You're getting to know each other, but it's an exclusive getting to know each other, right? You decide, okay, we want to date. It's exclusive, but it's not physically exclusive, right? It's There should be no physical, to be quite honest. It should be all about exclusively getting to know each other, looking for the future. Is this what God wants? I think if you're dating someone, you should pray right now and you should fast tomorrow. God, is this the person you want to be with you want me to be with for the rest of my life. If not, then send me a strong warning to leave. You know, again, I got to share and it's, it would be awkward if someone I've dated listens to this, but I hope they can appreciate just how we've all grown. And I think looking back in the past, I always said, God, you know, if this is the right one, open the door. Well, to me, I always thought the door was open because I just kept walking and it just worked out. But you have to come to the realization that we have free will. Just because the door is open doesn't mean God is opening it. That's that's a that's a profound thing that I think a lot of people are missing. We think if the door is open, it's God's right away. And I've made that mistake so many times. But are you truly asking? I tell people, if you ask, God will tell you who the right person is, who the wrong person is. You just need to ask. And you need to be um, expectant for a sign and say, God, is this the person I need you to show me? Because I just want your will to be done in my life. If you ask him that, you ask for his will to be done, he will answer. No doubt. He has answered me. He will answer you. And I know it's scary because you're like, I don't want him to say no to this person, but don't you want what God wants? He has seen your future. He knows what's going to work. Right? So that's, for me, what I learned is that the door was open because I was literally grabbing the handle and ripping it open. But the moment I started saying, God, is this the person? And then boom, he answered me. No, yes, no, yes. Now I feel total peace because I'm not going around searching. I I know, God, is this the person? No, okay. God, is this the person? Yes, okay. Right, we, we don't need to lean on our own understandings and all our ways acknowledge him. And what will he do? He will direct our paths. He will make straight the path. So don't just think because the door is open and because, you know, your boyfriend raises his hand at church, that means God wants you to be with him. You guys might be perfect for each other and God might say, "Mm, three years down the road, it ain't going to work. And actually, let's talk about this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. I know this is heavy, you guys, but just pray into this, you know, just God will answer you and, and check these things out with scripture telling you though once you see dating as a friendship more than a sexual partner and when i say sexual i'm not meaning you having sex i mean touchy feely gratify the flesh partner then it's no fun when you realize you're just free to have someone that you can fall in love with and you can if you share the same spirit as this person which you should we're just going to talk about being unequally yoked um, but you should share the same spirit with them and if you both have the holy spirit you're going to operate on a level that is unheard of. Your relationship will be blessed. And guess what? You have so much in common. You don't need to have kissing in common and and all that stuff. You have all the rest of your life to do that. This is the time where you get to know each other, where you get to connect and see your love for God poured out together. Right? I imagine for me is like, 
wow, when I get, when I get in my relationship, my end game relationship, we're going to study the Bible together. We're going to pray together. Our relationship is going to be predicated on God, not on each other, on, on what we want, what gratifies our flesh. Yeah, those, some of those days will come, but if it's predicated on God, if it's based on God, I don't know if predicated is the right word. Um, everything else will go well. Everything will go well and God will bless us so much. You have to see that perspective. So again, for 2 Corinthians 6, 14, what does it say? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and um, Belial? Oh, sorry. I'm like, am I missing something? Um, sorry. Um uh, what does a believer have in sorry that shook me? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So we are to be holy, not gratify the sinful nature. All right, what does he say right there? He literally says, I love that. Um, purify ourselves from everything that contaminates your body and your spirit. If you're walking in the Holy Spirit and then you're trying to yoke yourself to someone who doesn't walk with God, who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, who isn't open to submitting their whole life to God, then he's killing your spirit. He's he's, or she is not the right one for you. I'm sorry. They're contaminating your body, your spirit. They're making you unclean for God. But that's the problem. Like he's saying, what do you have in common with an unbeliever? So if I see someone who calls themselves a believer and they say they're filled, but they're dating someone that's not, and they're doing that by choice, I'm asking, do you really love God? Because if you love God, all that you would want to talk about, or let's say 80%, you know, obviously we're human, but 80% of the things you want to talk about, they would be about God. So what, what is this guy saying? Is Or what is this girl saying? Is they just shaking their head? Or are you not talking about God? Let's get to the let's get to the key thing. If you're yoked with someone that's not a believer, what the heck do you have in common? Or maybe you're really not focused on God either and you're more focused on the flesh. Maybe you're looking at this guy or girl like, wow, she's really pretty. Wow, he's really good looking. Oh, maybe he's a good kisser or whatever. But you're not sharing the same spirit. You're not sharing the same goal. But that probably means that your goals are incorrect. If your partner doesn't share in your goals, then you must not be vocal about your goals or you guys want to be together and you wouldn't want to be with this person. Why would you want to be with someone who doesn't share your goals and you'd want to share your life with them when you both have completely different career paths? Your career is to share the gospel and to make disciples and his is to be a sinner? I mean, what do you have in common? You don't. So if you're telling me you have all this in common, then you're lying to yourself by saying that you're in the light because you must be in the darkness. You see how it's so clear to see where you're at with God by your relationship? What is there? I love this. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? All right, because if you're not worshiping God, then you're worshiping idols. Everyone worships something. It just depends what it is. It's either God or idols. There's no way around it. Can't say you don't have God and you don't have idols. You have one. So how can you be worshiping God and your boyfriend be worshiping idols, yet you are thinking that it's a good idea to become one flesh, even though your flesh both wants something completely different? That makes total sense. So don't be yoked to the non-believer. That's number one, guys. If you're going to go into dating... Make sure, that's why I said the first day you should be talking about what are your what are your wants? What is your life about? Is it about Jesus or is it about everything else? Because if it's about everything else, then it's it's nothing. If it's about Jesus, then it's everything. And I'm sorry, there, there ain't no missionary dating. I'm, I'm so tired of that. We cannot have that in the church. I'm sorry, yes, go and make disciples, obviously, but it doesn't say go and make disciples dating them in Jesus' name. No, <laughs> it says go and make disciples baptizing them in Jesus' name, okay? So let's get this straight. Make disciples first, date later. And don't go making a disciple just because you think he's cute or she's cute. I'm sorry, you, your motives are wrong once again. Really got to focus on this. Really got to recenter. What is the point of all this? What 
is our motivation for being in this relationship. And again, these are the hard topics, you guys. I think this was one of the hardest topics we've had to cover. But this is learning to run. <laughs> we ain't walking anymore. This is, are you going to follow God or are you not? There's no in-between, you guys. And if, if you're not all on board, then you might as well get off right now because you're just wasting your time. It's either on or off. There's no in-between. There's no slow car. There's the fast car in one direction. There's the fast car in the other direction. You, car can't go both ways at once. That's ludicrous. That's impossible. So how do we date, right? We've talked about it. Let's just, let's just summarize. Let's conclude here. A little bit of a shorter message, but I think there's a lot to unpack. Uh, and But it's more so important for you, it's all about the application. You need to pray about this. You need to look at your own, my, your mind and think, what, what are my motivations in this relationship? What, what is causing me to lust that I'm indulging in? Because that's separating you from God. So what, you have a cool relationship. Would you like to be separated from God for eternity? I don't think so. How do we date? In my opinion, it's practicing love because it says, Love one another, brothers and sisters. If you're dating someone, they're nothing more than your sister or your brother in Christ. Until you are married, there's no in between. You're not, like I said, it's an exclusive brother. Let's just call it that. It's not, I mean, yes, I'm fine with you saying girlfriend or boyfriend. That, it, it's not about terms. I'm just trying to say that y'all are acting like you're basically married. So you have like more perks when you're dating. It's the same perks. You're just focusing on one person to learn about their life and to grow with them. Okay, it's not about you get this perk and that perk when you have a name. I don't read that in the Bible anywhere. So practice love, right? How do we do that? Let's go 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, right? What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envy. It is not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. So why am I saying this? Because how do we date in a biblical way? We need to practice the things we're going to be doing in marriage. And I'm not saying practicing kissing or, you know, having sex. Um, I'm talking about practicing the fundamental things of just being a brother in Christ. You know, it says if we don't have love... Um, you know, I'm a, a clanging symbol. It says that right above like a few verses of what I just read. So we have to love love with everyone, but especially with this, you know, specific brother or sister who you're having a focused relationship. Like we, like we said five minutes ago, like we're terming it a focused brother or focused sister relationship. You need to practice love because if you're a, if remember God used or Jesus used, um, his relationship with us to show relationship of marriage, right? That, um, that the church, um, sorry, sorry, the church and God, right? We both have a mutual love. We love God. He loves the church, right? He loves the church so much. He sent his son to die. So we have to practice love in a very specific way for this person. Like I said, you're dying to yourself when you're in a marriage relationship. So you need to start to practice that, right? You can't just expect that you know, you're all self-centered. And then when you get married, you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to not think about myself anymore. I'm just going to think about you. No, this is the time for practice. This is the time to see, can we do this together? Are we mature enough? Are we going to put God first? Number one, God first. Number two, and are we going to put each other first? Above friends, above everything else, right? Um, are we going to put each other first? And are we going to put the other person's needs first? first before ours. And I'm not saying to do this in a way that hurts you and, and, you know, self deprecates yourself or I don't even know if that's the right word, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, obviously you need to worry about yourself and make sure you're good. Um, don't make, you know, serving this person an idol. My point is we need to learn to love, right? Protect, trust, hope, perseveres, right? If you're going to be a partner with this person, you need to practice being a partner. And what do partners do? They they love, they have trust for each other. They don't delight in evil, right? They're not rude. They're not easily angered. They keep no records of wrongs. These are things you need to practice. And these are wholesome things that don't involve sex and don't involve uh, sinning against your body. These are very clear cookie, cookie cutter ways of being a better disciple and of practicing how marriage will look like someday. So that's number one, practice love in the most fundamental way.
Okay. And again, we're reading the Bible. It doesn't say the love languages are, you know, quality time, a physical touch. No, I'm sorry. I, I, yes, I see how some of those things apply, but what is he saying is love? It's serving the other person. The love languages make us think, and this is just coming to my mind right now. The love languages make us think about what do I need? What do I need? I need this. I need this. But God's way is thinking about what the other person needs. So yes, be aware of their love languages, but stop being like, well, this is my love language. This is what I need because that again is self-serving. That is about you. Love is about the other person. You know, there's no greater love than he who lay his life down for a friend, right? Right. Are you willing to die to yourself for this person long term? If you're not, then you're not ready to be in a relationship with this person. God forbid marriage. Okay, this is what we have to tackle. Number one, love. Can I love this person? I'm not saying saying I love you, this mushy gushy love. I'm saying acted out love. Love that has action, not love that just says I love you and gives you a hug. No, love that has action. Okay. So that's huge. Um and I think, you know, I was going to read Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, but if you're interested, go check it out. It's about marriage. But I think that's something else you should study with your person, right? How does it look for us to be married? How does it look? And again, it doesn't say, okay, have sex all the time. Make sure you kiss enough. Yeah, of course, these things come with marriage. But when you're in this exclusive brother-sister relationship, you need to be looking at what are we looking forward to? What what are the things we need to work on? You know, like, hmm, if I talk to my mom this way, I'm not going to talk to my wife very well. You know, if I'm not helping with the dishes, if I'm not being helpful around the house, how do I expect to help my wife? You know, we have to learn to be a servant. What was Jesus? He was a servant, right? Uh, we talked about that in another episode, how he was always serving other people. That's how a relationship should look like, right? Again, pleasing the physical needs, which is making out and, and sex and all this stuff. Those are... Those are pleasing yourself. Oh, this is what I need. I need your attention. I need this. Okay, that is totally the wrong way. When we come to God, we say, God, what can I do for you? Obviously, we all pray, God, can you give me this? Can you help me with this? Help me with this. But number one, we're saying, God, I'm here for you. Use me. How, how, what do you want me to do? That's the same way. Hey, girl. Hey, guy. I'm, I'm here. I'm here for you. If you need me, I'm here. Um, I can help you with anything. I'll lay down my time, my life. Um, to help you, to help you grow with God, to to uh, fulfill your needs. This is love. And this ain't easy. So stop stepping into relationships just thinking, okay, we're just going to wing it and it's going to work. We're going to live on love. You don't even know what love means. You don't even live in love. So again, sorry, that's, we're going in on this one, but just pray about it. That's what I like to say nowadays. You know, I used to think, oh, I got to control what people think and I got to make sure that they... They have the right understanding. Listen, I know that this is the truth, but I don't want you to come to it because I said it, okay? Go and pray about this yourself. Read in scripture. Ask the Holy Spirit. He's inside of you, if he is inside of you. Um, is this right? You're going to feel it. I, I know. I felt convicted every time I did something wrong. I was like, that crossed the line. Even though the world says that was totally fine, that crossed the line for me. Pray about who you're interested in, okay? Think about what are my motives, is this for my glory or for God's glory? Is this fulfilling my needs or God's needs, right? And that will answer all your questions. We need to be focused on a partner is for ministry and for the benefit of other people, not for ourselves, right? We're slowly learning to die to ourselves. And it's hard. I'm not saying this is easy, guys. This is something that I wrestle with. But it's the wrestling that makes us stronger. That's actually kind of funny because that actually makes sense physically, but... It's the wrestling that makes us stronger. If we never wrestle with these heavy topics, then we're just going to get in the the ring and we're totally going to get beat up and we're going to fall into all these things, right? We have to wrestle with these things. Yeah, it's hard. It's ugly. It's it's tough. But I tell you, for the last three years of wrestling, I've come to a very clear spot with it. And I've realized that as I did that, God transformed what I want. I was always thinking the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the beauty, the, the you know, um, fulfillment physically or whatever. But now I just see it as like, man, I can't wait to have a best friend who I get to call my wife. Like, that's beautiful. That's what God designed it to be. So just dwell on these things, you know? It might take a year for you to even come to grips with it, but this is a heavy topic and this is something we need to think about because I know every single person listening wants to get married. I don't care if you want to lie to yourself and say you don't. You want love, 
But are you finding your love in Christ first? That's huge. That was huge for me. Everything changed when I realized that I needed to find my love in Christ first, that I needed to marry Christ. Am I perfect at it? No. I'm telling you guys, I still think, man, God, you know, I'd love to have a wife. But I catch myself and I apologize. Like, no, God, no, I am. I, I literally declare this. Guys, it's not wrong to declare things over your life. Your words have power. You might feel weird and all like a, too spiritual or something. But I say to myself, God, I just declare in the name of Jesus that I am um, no less, right? I am uh, full. I am, I am um, lacking nothing. Yeah, can you guys just say that with me right now? Lord God, uh, I just declare in the name of Jesus that I lack nothing with you, that I have everything with you, that I don't need a boyfriend. I don't need a girlfriend. I don't need any relationship besides my relationship with you. Just repeat that. That's powerful. I declare that a lot of a lot of the time because it's renewing of your mind. You know, when the Bible says renew your mind, sometimes you got to talk, your, talk yourself into it. So speaking it out, declaring it in the supernatural realm, that's powerful, right? And pray for your spouse, okay? If you really love this person, pray for them. Pray for their um, their salvation. Pray for their spirituality. God has someone for all of us. I believe that. You know, I'm not saying I can just pull you to somewhere where it says that in scripture, but God knowing the end from the beginning and all that good stuff, I, I know that he has prepared a person for all of us. Um, but are we going to try to take the reins and take control and be like, well, I, I like this person because this, 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 or are we just going to listen to God and be like, God, What's your will? I, I dare you tonight to go to bed and say, God, show me your will for my life. Show me who you want me to be with and I will have peace about that. I guarantee you he will show up. I guarantee it. Pray in faith. Remember, James says, if you pray in faith, you will receive um, what you prayed for. So yeah, guys, I love you guys so much and I, I hope you like this teaching and, and hope you benefit from it, guys. I, I just, the reason I'm so passionate is I want to be a young generation you know, I'm only 22, that we have strong beliefs. We have strong convictions. We don't always have to be the odd man out like, oh, really, you believe in that? No, we have each other, you guys. And yes, yeah, sometimes there is persecution. Man, not sometimes. There's a lot of persecution, okay? And we haven't even started it, but at least we have each other. At least you can fall back and like, it's possible. Taylor's done it. This person's done it. You guys can do it too, okay? Hold yourself back from sexual immorality, okay? And, and it pleases God so much. So let's just, Let's just uh, pray. Um, dear Lord God, I, I just thank you so much for just speaking and, and just for your word and, and just for relationship. God, I know even just friendships, God, are beautiful. You've created something so beautiful. I mean, even you called the church, you know, this body of believers. God, it's so beautiful. God, I pray for one that you would give us wisdom, Lord, and, and the people that we decide to link ourselves with, Lord, and one day yoke ourselves with. God, that we would... See it as such a heavy thing. I think we just date out of just fun and and all the wrong reasons nowadays, God. And I am guilty myself that I've done that in my past life, yet I know you've washed that away. I know you've taken away my shame. God, I pray that you would take away every single person's shame here tonight, listening or today, um, that you would help renew their mind and you would help them set up better boundaries for themselves, God, that, that they would know you have a plan and your plan is good. And just because it doesn't look the way they want it to isn't just because it's not the person that they think it's going to be just because the person doesn't look this way or you have a person for all of us and it's the best person, God, and help us all lean into that, including myself, God. We thank you, Lord. We just love you, God. We lift your name on high. You are the good Lord. We praise you, Jesus, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for just dying for us, God, and giving us the right to even have a relationship. I mean, who are we to ask for love and all these things? God, we've got your love. We lack nothing. We lack nothing. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Love you. Love you. I love you, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, there you go. There's your teaching on relationships. I hope you benefited from it. If you need to re-listen to it, please do. There's nothing wrong with that. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see where this takes you guys and just how thing, how God speaks to you and how he benefits your relationships because of your obedience to him. Obedience is number one, you guys. Love you guys. I thank you for buying a t-shirt again. I thank you for all your support. If you haven't checked out the website, jesusisoffensive.com, email us at, it's hello uh, at jesusisoffensive.com. I've messed that up so many times. So hello at jesusisoffensive.com. Email me, literally just say, what's up? Hey, 
I'll reply back and say, yo, uh, would love to talk to you guys. Would love to connect. And just, if there's any prayer requests, literally, I feel like you guys think that you're being a burden. I'm literally checking my email every day. Oh, did anyone email me? Did anyone email me? I, I want to pray for someone. I want to connect. I want to make disciples. This is what it's all about. You guys reach out, be bold. And I just pray that you're just encouraged by this message, guys. And then just have a great weekend and pray on all these things. Ask God for wisdom and understanding. and He will direct your paths. I promise you that. Love you guys. And uh, I will see you guys next week.